Hi guys, it's Professor Moore. Hurricane Andrew has given me some time to catch up on my review videos. Uh, I hope you're all staying safe. This is just going to be a quick video to finish up the one that I did earlier on notice to the defendant, uh, constitutional dimensions, and then serving process under the statutory requirements. So this video is going to talk about a procedure in federal court whereby the plaintiff can ask the defendant to waive service of process so that um, the plaintiff has doesn't have to go to the expense and trouble of serving process formally through a process server. So we talked a bit about the difficulties there could be in serving process, um, especially in a foreign country, and uh, just wanted to let you know, for those of you that might be interested, that a federal judge recently authorized service of process via Twitter under Rule 4. Uh, if you want to go to that link, that's just the... Um, uh, federal Civil Procedure and Federal Courts Law Professors blog that I'm the co-editor of. So here's the general rule. Rule 4D1, requesting a waiver. An individual, corporation, or association that is subject to service under Rule 4E, F, or H has a duty to avoid unnecessary expenses of serving the summons. And by the way, that asterisk in there I put that in there, that's not in the rule, and that's just to clarify that the only people who are not under that duty to avoid unnecessary expenses, in other words, a duty to waive um, service of process if possible, uh, the only people who are not under that duty are an individual in the United States or a foreign country who is a minor or incompetent the United States or its agencies, and state, local, or foreign governments. Those entities do not have the duty to waive service of process. Everyone else does. Um, so continuing with Rule 4D1, the plaintiff may notify such a defendant that an action has been commenced, in other words, a complaint has been filed, and request that the defendant waive service of a summons. The notice and request must and then there's a list of things that the notice and request have to say. But if you use the form that um, is on the uh, United States court website, that's what it looks like. Notice of a lawsuit and request to waive service of a summons. Um, you will say all the right things. So you send the plaintiff, or, I'm sorry, you send the defendant a copy of this notice filled out, um, a copy of the complaint, of course, two copies of the waiver form, one for the defendant to fill out and keep, and one for the defendant to fill out and send back to the plaintiff, and also a prepaid means of returning the waiver form. Um, so just to clarify, if you follow this procedure under Rule 4D, you're not effectuating service. You are asking the defendant to waive service. So we don't have service. You can send the um, package with all the required documents in it by first class mail, and it must be addressed to uh, an individual defendant, if it's a person, and if it's a business entity, an officer, a managing or general agent, or any other agent authorized by appointment or by law to receive service of process. Here's what the waiver of the service of summons form looks like. So you, as the plaintiff's attorney, would send two copies of this form along with the first form, the notice of a lawsuit, and of course the complaint and a prepaid means of complying. So the time limits on this. If the defendant chooses to waive service,
then the defendant must return the waiver to the plaintiff within 30 days of when the request was sent. If the defendant is outside the United States, um, that's bumped up to 60 days after the request was sent. If the defendant does not waive service by that time, the plaintiff must serve process in the normal way. That's a result of, you know, following the 4D procedure not being actual service. So if you have a statute of limitations concern, like it's about to run, you don't want to do waiver of service um, because the defendant gets 30 days to think about it. And by the time you figure out that you need to go ahead and get a process server um, and get that done within the 90 days that you're allowed after the filing of the complaint under Rule 4M, uh, you may run out of time and the statute of limitations may run. So if you have any uh, concern at all about the statute of limitations, I would go ahead and hire a process server. Otherwise, um, if, if you have a defendant that's not likely to avoid service, like a corporation that's just sitting there, um, you might ask for service to be waived. Okay, so here's a multiple choice question. Plaintiff, a Michigan corporation, filed suit against defendant, a New York corporation, in federal district court in Michigan on the basis of diversity of citizenship. Plaintiff mailed by first class mail to defendant's corporate counsel on May 15th a copy of the complaint, a notice of a lawsuit and request to waive service of a summons, two copies of the waiver of the service of summons form, and a prepaid means for returning the waiver form. Defendant had not returned a signed waiver form by July 10th, so plaintiff sent an additional copy of the complaint to defendant's corporate counsel via FedEx, an overnight courier. Assume that neither Michigan nor New York state rules provide for any methods of service of process beyond those in the federal rules of civil procedure. Which of the following statements is true? A. Plaintiff properly served process on defendant because defendant's corporate counsel is a general agent of defendant. B. Defendant waived service of process by failing to return the waiver form within 30 days after plaintiff sent it. C. Plaintiff did not validly effect service of process, nor did defendant waive service of process. D. None of the above. So, the correct answer here was C. For those of you that got it, congratulations. Um, let me go through why A and B are wrong. Um, a is plaintiff properly served process on defendant. Uh, as I just said, no, this procedure is not a service of process. This procedure is a request to the defendant to forego service of process. Um, so no service of process was served. Um, the rest of it is kind of a red herring because defendant's corporate counsel is a general agent of defendant. That may be true, but um, it's still not proper service because uh, the only other thing in the in the facts that you might have thought was service was when plaintiff sent an additional copy of the complaint to defendant's corporate counsel via FedEx, but um, the federal rules, um, 4-H, uh, specifically governing corporations, do not provide for service of process by FedEx. Uh, and the, uh, the question stipulates that neither Michigan, um, the, place, uh, the place where the action is filed, nor New York, the place where um, presumably service is taking place, because that's where the defendant is located, um, neither of those two states has any method of service other than those that are explicitly stated in the federal rules. I doubt that's really true, but for purposes of the problem, that's what, what you're given. So uh, there was no proper service here because the federal rules of civil procedure do not allow service of process by FedEx, nor is requesting a waiver of service actual service. So that's why B is wrong. So C is actually correct. Plaintiff did not validly affect service of process, nor did defendant waive service of process. Oh, sorry, I skipped B. B is wrong. D, uh, defendant waived service of process by failing to return the waiver form within 30 days after plaintiff sent it. That's kind of the opposite of what occurs here. Defendant has to affirmatively send the waiver form back within 30 days in order to waive service. 
the defendant isn't automatically kind of got to if they don't send it back within 30 days. So B is just wrong. And D, none of the above is wrong because C is right. Okay, so finally, a few words about um, some additional points. Um, there's kind of a carrot and a stick aspect going on to the waiver of service under 4D. The carrot to the defendant for agreeing to waive is that the defendant gets 60 days to answer from the date that the request to waive was sent. Uh, if the defendant is outside the United States, the defendant gets uh, 90 days to answer um, from the date that the request to waive was sent. And uh, they only, a defendant only gets 21 days if they receive a normal service of process. So, um, you know, even though it's common to ask for an extension of time to answer or otherwise respond to a complaint, um, getting almost 40 additional days can be very helpful. The stick uh, held above the defendant, however, if the defendant does not agree to waive, uh, and has the duty to waive, which most people do, um, is that they must pay the plaintiff's costs of service unless they have good cause. And good cause is not probably what your client thinks is good cause. Good cause is not belief that the lawsuit is unfounded or frivolous. And even if you have a good objection to subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, or venue, it is still not good cause to refuse to waive service because those objections are not waived if you waive service of process. The only objections that are waived are objections to service, obviously, because you're waiving service. Um, so that's it, and uh, I hope you all are staying safe and uh, having a good time off of school anyway, and I'll see you soon and be back hopefully soon with uh, another review video. So have a good day and um, or have a good night.